Good morning, everyone, and welcome to UCL. My name is Nicola Brewer, and I'm Vice Provost International here at UCL, and I've been here for three years uh, so far. After 30 years away from higher education, uh, when I was working in the British Diplomatic Service. As Vice Provost International, I'm responsible for our global engagement strategy. You can find it on the, on the web. And I can sum up that strategy in 13 words. I'm puzzled by the music, but hey, it's fine as background. Um, uh, we're London's global university. We work with partners to achieve fair solutions to global challenges. That's how we, how we sum up our global engagement strategy. It means I spend my days facilitating academic collaborations internationally and cultivating partnerships with other global higher education institutions around the world. Could you just put your hand up if you can hear me over the nice piano music? Just about, okay, I'll go on shouting. Um, so I, I spend my time uh, cultivating global partnerships around the world from, uh, let me think, um, Beijing to Durban in South Africa, Sorry, we to Toronto, I'm fine, to Toronto, to Santiago, uh, um, and almost every other capital you can think about. So I do clock up a fair amount of, of air miles. I was asked in this introductory slide to say, what do I think about when I think about UCL? Well, first of all, as I come to work every morning uh, and I get off the bus at Russell Square, it makes me smile to come on campus. And I, I would say I think of a bunch of words. I think uh, creative, talented, heart of London, of course, interdisciplinary problem solving, and disruptive in a good way. When I did my PhD, more years ago than I care to remember, I was actively discouraged from thinking across discipline boundaries. That wouldn't happen at, at UCL. So moving on to the next slide, um, track back a little bit to when we were founded. 1826, okay, you're in 1826 and you want to go to university. You have two choices in England. You can go to Oxford or you can go to Cambridge. But oops, you can only do that if you're a man, if you're a member of the established church, uh, if you're white and if you're wealthy. So if you're not one of those things, and we were in 1826, you couldn't go at all. So UCL was established to give people who don't fit that very narrow category a chance at higher education. And here we are with our fabulous pictures of Jeremy Bentham. He is known as the spiritual founder of UCL, and he was one of those people who wanted a fairer and different way of doing things. So he and the other founders came up with a different set of ent entry requirements based on Jeremy Bentham's belief that education should be available to all who could benefit from it, much wider than that narrow band of people I've just described. So UCL prides itself on the fact that it was the first university in England to accept women students on equal terms with men. I do sometimes tease our president and provost that it did take UCL 50 years to get to that, but nevertheless, we got there sooner than other universities in England. Um, and we were the first to disregard social or religious backgrounds. So our founders had a much wider notion of what education uh, should cover. And we were also the first university in England to offer systematic teaching of subjects like, now I'm, I'm expecting this list to surprise you, the first university in England to offer the systematic te teaching of English, German, chemistry, civil engineering, and architecture. So at the time, it's really hard to imagine now, that was considered a really bold and radical move. No one in England had heard of anything like it. And the founders, founding of UCL was, at the time, incredibly controversial. The historian uh, Thomas Arnold described us as that godless institution in Gower Street. And if any of you know any students at King's College uh, London, they still refer to UCL that way. And we don't mind a bit. Um, one of the reasons I came to UCL three years ago was because I was attracted by its ethos of equality and diversity and, and inclusion. So going right back to its founding. So that's history. What's it like uh, today? 
Today, if you look at virtually any of the well-known global university rankings, you will find UCL comfortably in the top 20 and usually in the top 10 in the world. Um, so one of the, one of the uh, rankings is known as QS, and we've just been ranked by that as seventh top university in the world for the third year in a row. We've had, as the slide says, 29 Nobel Prize winners amongst our present and former students and academic staff. And we do believe that our core academic success comes from those principles I described dating back to 1826. If I can just describe the first year I came in 2014. So I was with um, President and Provost Michael Arthur in New York about to host an alumni party. And we were in one of those New York yellow taxis and it had a television screen in it. And as we were in the taxi, as we stepped into the taxi, there was a UCL professor who also came from New York, but UCL professor just won the Nobel Prize. It was the most fabulous introduction to the uh, alumni party. That was John O'Keefe. Um, we very much work to be inclusive. We invest more in widening participation activity than any other London university. And we have one of the biggest widening participation teams in the country, helping to make sure that students who want to come to us, talented students, are not held back by a lower household income or the fact that they might be the first person in their family to go to university. Our tradition of teaching innovation continues. Um, the example I'd flag up, you'll see it as you go down Mallet Place, is our new Arts and Sciences BASC, in which students are explicitly invited to study subjects that don't usually, uh, they aren't traditionally taught together. So you might study engineering and anthropology, or philosophy and biology. And there are hundreds of interdisciplinary projects going on at any one time at UCL, but we have a special focus on what we call the grand challenges, which is looking to solve some of the world's most pressing problems by approaching them from a cross-disciplinary perspective. So you'll find UCL academics from across the institution looking at things like housing, healthcare, transport, clean water and sustainability, and contributing to government, government policy in those areas. We, we like to say, I don't know if there's anybody in the room who wants to be a civil engineer, um, we like to say that civil engineers build bridges, but a UCL civil engineer will build a bridge and will think about what's on either side of the bridge in terms of people, culture, economies, politics, and so much more. So one of the themes, we've got a campaign running, a fundraising campaign at the moment. Um, one of the themes of that campaign is, one of the, is, is we are rebels with a cause, with global causes, and we are raising money to fund new research and facilities to make sure that we can continue to be leaders in uh, innovation, innovation, inclusiveness, and cross-disciplinarity. And I'll say a tiny bit more about that in a minute. Um, but uh, money and investment for, for a moment, as you walk around the campus, I don't know how much you've done already, you will probably notice quite a lot of building work being carried out. And that's part of a, a big program of activity called Transforming UCL. We're investing more than we ever have done to make sure that our facilities and our buildings and our teaching and our learning spaces are fit for the future. Not just for students arriving this autumn, uh, but for generations of students to come. So as part of that, we're going to be expanding uh, with state-of-the-art laboratory research and teaching facilities currently being created at, it's called Here East, on the site of the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park at Stratford in East London. Um, and that's where we will open a, uh, a second campus with our first students arriving there in 2020. Did anybody here happen to be listening to the Radio 4 Today programme at about half past seven this morning? Well, if you had, or if you do the listen again thing, you'll hear a clip which I think, and even the Today presenters, who are quite, um, uh, uh, quite cynical from time to time, they were, they were enchanted by the sounds of different bat noises. And it's a professor, uh, Kate Jones, a UCL academic, who's running a study at the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park um, to learn more about the different kinds of sounds and different ways that uh, bats can communicate. Um, I'm always very proud when UCL academics are on the Today programme, because I have it on from the moment I wake up. Um, and it happens 
very often. Anyway, it was Kate Jones today. Um, next slide. Um, this is a flavour of what's going on right here and now in terms of this transforming UCL programme here in Bloomsbury. Bloomsbury. This uh, slide, I, I'm, I'm not, um, uh, in terms of orienteering, I'm not brilliant, but I, I'm confident that behind me the slide will show you the Bartlett School of Architecture, which is in 22 Gordon Street, uh, a new building that was opened a couple of weeks ago. Do go in and have a look. It's absolutely fabulous, and they've got their summer show on at the moment. We've also got new facilities for earth sciences and physics students, and the Wilkin ter Terrace, which is going to be a fabulous new public space, will be opening this September. Um, as well as new study space around the corner in Torrington Place. Just two others to mention. We're in the process of um, the final stages of refurbishing our law building, uh, which is called Bentham House for reasons that are obvious. And the jewel in the crown of this whole project is going to be a brand new student centre due to open in 2018. Uh, and it will offer a thousand new study spaces and IT, top IT facilities as well as a hub for student in inquiries, right in the heart of our campus here in Bloomsbury. So all of that adds up to a really exciting time for all of us at UCL. And what we're, what we're doing, of, of course, is to work to make sure that our students have access to world-class facilities to match the world-class teaching and access to research that we offer. So our students joining uh, in, in uh, autumn um, uh, 2018 will have access to all of those facilities and they will be gradually coming on on stream um, something about how how we teach what we do at UCL at UCL we want you to learn how to think not what to think um, we are very much a research-led university with some of the best minds on the planet making new discoveries every day um, in the last few months, you might have seen or heard on the media our academics around discovering the world's oldest fossils, using data from a mobile phone game to investigate the development of dementia, investigating the use of statins to treat multiple sclerosis, analysing the general election, and even preserving smells as cultural heritage. You might think that if you're coming to UCL as an undergraduate, that won't have much to do with you. But it's a point of principle that all of our undergraduate teaching is continually reviewed to make sure that it takes account of the latest discoveries. And our Connected Curriculum initiative enables our students to make connections with active researchers and with each other, and to give them the opportunity to participate in research activities of their own. What a lot of our researchers say is that they are surprised by how often either questions or suggestions by their undergraduates help them shape their research. So it's not a one-way process, it's a two-way two process. And more generally, we really invite our students to have a say in how their degree programme is run via a project that we call Changemakers, where staff and students together work to come up with ways of improving their particular course. When we developed our global engagement strategy back in 2014, I made sure that we consulted students and student groups like the LGBT plus group. Um, we have a small committee that oversees implementation of the strategy and I have students uh, sitting on that. We also have some of the best facilities available, including, I didn't know this until this morning when I reviewed um, my notes, 18 libraries and we make widespread use of alternative teaching methods, taking your studies out of the classroom or out of the lecture theatre setting. Um, those on the applied medical sciences degree, for example, learn with online lectures and interactive content. They call it flipped teaching. So you, you see the lecture online, then you go to the class and you have an interactive exchange with the, with the lecturer. And then on the next slide, which we're turning to, I'm going to say something about UCL's global perspective. Now, because this is my particular field, um, I'm going to rely on um, my colleague, Colette, um, not to let me go on too long about this one. But I think this is one of UCL's greatest strengths. And of course, it's one of London's greatest strengths, the sheer diversity of our population. Our work is truly global. 
We attract students and staff from all over the world and we celebrate and appreciate the different perspectives and experience that they bring. Um, absolutely integral to part of being a UCL student is a global way of thinking. Um, so you might guess that some recent comments about global citizens um, being citizens of nowhere is not one that resonates personally with me. I think being a global citizen means you are comfortable with diversity, comfortable with different perspectives, happy to experience and travel different countries, different parts of the world. Um, all of our students get the chance to participate in what we call our Global Citizenship Programme. It's a two-week programme that takes place after the summer exams and students work together in interdisciplinary teams coming up with ideas to solve various problems that have been set by externals who come in and then uh, adjudicate on their, on their results. They might, for example, say, how do you design a greener city? Um, or how do you explore the relationship between the environment and health? Or look at climate change from the perspective of justice. Um, and in your second year and beyond, you can go further and you can develop skills like entrepreneurship that will prepare you for life after, after university. Um, a bit about, about being here, being in the heart of London. Um, Bloomsbury is very much uh, the historic heart of London where Virginia Woolf lived and the Bloomsbury set, which was another notable group of rebels uh, back in the 1920s. And it's still a very pretty and relatively green and quiet part of London. But, but don't be fooled for a moment by the relative tranquility in the various parks because we are absolutely part of London's Knowledge Quarter Partnership. That's a group of over 75 academic, cultural, research, scientific and media organisations based in the Bloomsbury and the King's Cross area. We're, we're just a stone's throw from some of London's famous museums, libraries and centres of excellence. The British Library, the Wellcome Centre, the British Museum, London Zoo, Great Ormond Street Hospital, the National Gallery, the Francis Crick and the South Bank. Uh, you have to go down the Strand for that one to name just a few. And all of those resources can be great for your, your studies because we work in partnership with people from those sectors. And it means that as well as learning from the academic staff that we have, you will be learning from practicing lawyers, engineers, architects, authors, and entrepreneurs. And you know, the whole of London is kind of like your laboratory or your, or your lecture theater. And of course, London, attracts the biggest names, the best talent. Um, in the past few years, we've hosted guest lectures from people like Amartya Sen, Noam Chomsky, Na Naomi Klein, Grayson Perry. I was at that one, it was an absolute hoot. Um, Ian Hislop, Arundhati Roy, and Nicola Sturgeon. And, and of course, then when you have time off, there's the, the West End with cinemas, theatres, shops and restaurants just 10 minutes away by bus or bike. It's only about 15 minutes if you walk as well. Um, London really does offer anything you could want for, for work and play. Um, uh, when I thought about repeating the work and play thing, it reminds me of an old ad. Apologies for that, but it's true. It's true. So um, on to the next slide, I think. Yes. Um, being at university is not uh, all about your academic work, um, though, of course, that's really important. Um, the lecturers I was talking to said, please don't say it doesn't matter. Um, it's also a chance to make new friends, explore a new environment and get involved with or continue your involvement with all kinds of activities. Um, I've got a 24-year-old daughter and a 22-year-old son, both at university at the moment. The thing I am happiest about, I mean, I'm delighted when they get good marks, of course, is that they've made fantastic friends. And I think that's really one of the most important things. So the fact that we've got a really active opportunities for you to make a contribution to your local community through things like volunteering, student politics, or a club or society. There's just a huge range of things to get involved with. Um, I've got a list here. Boxing, badminton, fashion, photography, journalism, business and banking, ba not banking, baking. Um, if, you, uh, if you love Harry Potter or Beyonce, there's a society for you. And if you can't find a society that represents your interests, you can start one. Um, we're guessing 
that if you come to UCL, there'll be a bit of you that's actually worrying about what you do after uh, university. You'll be thinking about what you do when you graduate. And we get asked about this a lot. So as you can see from the slide, um, we've got a really impressive support for, a uh, really impressive record for graduate employment. And this is one of the things that's reflected in the silver rating that we got in the pilot year of the Teaching Excellence Framework. Um, but our first reaction to that was, we're not going to rest until we get to gold. But of students graduating in 2015, 90% um, were in work or further study six months after graduating from us. And our graduate salaries, I'm sorry to talk about, um, about money, but our graduate salaries are consistently above uh, the national average. In 2015, the median starting salary for UCL graduates was around £3,000 higher than the uh, national average. Just something worth tucking away at the back of your mind. This is a picture, I've met this, um, this guy. Um, this is a picture which uh, illustrates uh, how when it comes to finding a career at UCL, there is a huge amount of support for you, both during your degree and afterwards. So there will be skills embedded in your degree, like researching and presenting complex information, time management and uh, team working skills. You will be able to access support if you want to set up and run a business like Arthur Kay did. Um, through UCL in Innovation Enterprise. We've got a great, a great careers service, um, and we've got a really good and growing alumni network, which provides mentoring, advice, and networking. So um, Arthur Kay, um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the, the BioBean uh, initiative, but he's certainly one of our most high-profile recent graduates. He, his, um, his subject was um, architecture, and he went on to found a company called BioBean perhaps the most obvious thing for an architecture student, but he did that with the help of UCL Innovation and Enterprise. And what it does is it takes used coffee grounds from cafes and restaurants and recycles them uh, into biofuel. And in 2015, Arthur became the youngest ever gra um, Guardian Sustainable Business Leader of the Year. And in 2016, he won, uh, or his company won, the Virgin Media Business Grow campaign. Um, category uh, in that award uh, sector from, from Virgin. Arthur only graduated in 2013, which means that in 2010, so just seven years ago, he was sitting where you're sitting now. Uh, and that's just uh, evidence of what you can do if you come to UCL in a very short space of time. Um, next slide is around what we think really, really sets UCL apart. and it's our students. Um, the one thing that hasn't changed since 1826 is we are looking for students who will benefit most from the kind of education that we have to offer. And although we don't look at things like your gender, your religious or your social background, we do have a rigorous selection process. We look for top grades, but we're also looking for people who are intellectually curious. We want students who think for themselves and who question what they're taught. We don't want people who want to be told what to think. We want students who can articulate their motivation to study and who can see the powerful potential of a university education. We are really conscious that choosing where you go to university is one of the biggest decisions you'll ever make and we know that can be daunting because there's a huge amount to consider. I've got one piece of advice today about um, what might help you make, make your decision about where to apply. And that is to bombard the people you see in bright yellow t-shirts with questions and also our academic staff, uh, but especially the student helpers, the ones in the bright yellow t-shirt, there's one sitting at the back there, um, who um, will be able to tell you what it's really like to be here. Um, I didn't do that when I first went to university years and years ago and I ended up leaving my first place and going to another one. So my advice is ask the questions before you go or before you come and go one better than me and get your first choice right. A lot of our current students and our past ones say that actually it was attending our open day that really gave them the kind of feel 
for the kind of place that UCL is and that it helped to crystallise their decision to apply. Or you might decide this isn't the place for you and that's, that's okay too because everybody wants something slightly different from their university experience. But I hope that you have a fabulous open day with us and I very much hope to be here to welcome some of you at least back to UCL next, next September. Thank you, enjoy your day. to do the um oh get detached okay if they don't want to do the you can it that's fine thank okay. you very much you were fantastic Great. thank you right is hello so if you need to go to get to a talk that's absolutely fine I'm going to do um, about 20 minutes on applying through UCAS. So if you, people need to go out, just go out at the back and I'll tell you a little bit from a UCL point of view about applying. So, um, many of you, I'm sure, are at really great schools and colleges and will know some of this, but you apply through UCAS, uh, you have five choices and you have to register online. Um, you, we recommend you do use all five choices, but think about what those choices are, because you may end up going to one of them. And I know from talking to some of you already in the audience, you've been doing a lot of research, and you apply to them, and then later on you'll have to make some choices about who you hold firm or insurance. Now, the real deadlines are the 15th of October for medicine, dentistry, veterinary science, and Oxbridge, and the 15th of January for everything else. But whenever I say this at a school or college, you see the head of sick form twitching because many schools and colleges have earlier deadlines and obviously you should be ready to go for the earlier deadlines with your schools. Uh, the two myth-busting facts I'm going to tell you from the UCL side of the fence is we don't look at applications on a first-come, first-served basis. I know a lot of people feel the pressure, even if they're not applying for Oxbridge, to get in before the 15th of October but I'm here to reassure you saying it's better to get an application in that you and your teachers are happy with than to rush it. We're very experienced. We um, do a staged gate process, so we will look at them in bunches to make sure that the really talented students, when their applications arrive, we've got places to make them offers. Um, and the other myth that goes around is about us knowing where else you've applied. Now, clearly, students who apply early, there's a good indication that they've probably applied for Oxbridge, but we genuinely don't know. We only know who else you've applied for after you've done your firm and insurance, and we know whether we're firm and who your insurance is or if we're your insurance choice. And then after that, UCAS gives us a load of data um, about who UCL was generally in the same basket as. But I know some students are quite anxious about this, and I just say, we don't know when you're applying, we only see that you're applying to us, and we know you, there will be four others in the mix. Um, in terms of applications to UCL, it is highly competitive. We had 44,000 applications this year for 18,200 places. Um, it varies by course, and to just give you a sense here of some of the cohort sizes, so medicine was seven, seven applications for every place. Now, there were 322 places available this year, so there's some mathematicians in the room, I'm sure, who can work out how many people applied for medicine. PPE was 26 to 1, but there were only 41 places. Uh, fine art, 40 places in total, so 22 applications for every place. And architecture is 102 places. There were 14 applications for every place. UCL average is about eight. Now, my tip to all of you, unless you're absolutely certain you want to be a medic, absolutely certain you only want to do fine art, absolutely certain you only want to do English, is have a look at shoulder subjects. Sometimes, if you wanted to study English with us, I think it is eight to one, or was eight to one this year, but you've got an A-level in a modern language, you might want to look at comparative literature because it is slightly easier because fewer people apply and then you're studying world literature. You may or may not need to actually use your language skills. 
I'm sure you're all extremely able students in the room, but if you aren't absolutely set on one degree, have a look at the related degrees and you might see that the applications per place would be more in your favour. But I'm not advocating that you do something you're not passionate about. It's just to open your minds up, because often when I talk to sixth form students, they think they've got to study what they did at A level. And sometimes, actually, just moving things a little bit, you start to see some other options. So we're going to talk a little bit about further about how we select applicants. And again, I'm sure your schools will have told you a lot of this, that everything comes in um, through UCAS. We look at your qualifications, uh, the personal statement, the teacher's reference, and um, aptitude tests. So I'll say a little bit more about that now. Um, the academic requirements, as you'd expect at a university like UCL, are quite high. Some programmes have specific requirements. So for law, we take the LNAT, which is done in January. It's an online test. For medicine, we do the BMAT, which is in November and on paper. But they're both aptitude tests, and you need to check particularly with medicine. Some use UK CAT. We use BMAT. So look at all your choices and make sure you're doing the right aptitude tests. And also with medicine, um, that you're probably picking universities that have both. Um, with architecture and fine art, we're going to be looking for a portfolio. With architecture, they will invite you to in if they invite you to interview, they'll look at the portfolio there. Fine art often ask for it to be submitted in advance. But again, if those are subjects you're interested in, make sure you talk to the academics and the departments today so you're really clear what they're looking for. We only do interviews these days for so medicine, fine art, architecture and English. Most universities don't even do that number of interviews. And it really is just to do with the volume of places. But again, just make sure you're very clear for all your UCAS choices, whether you're going to be doing an interview. And if you do your interview, make sure you read your personal statement again. So more on that. So the personal statement. Um, I know this is a great source of anxiety to some students, but um, your schools will advise you on this. And I've worked with a number of admissions tutors. And the thing they always say is if you can't write a good personal statement, if you haven't got loads of examples and it doesn't just flow and you've got more than the um, 40,000 characters, then you probably haven't found what you want to study. It's about defining what your passion is. There isn't a right or wrong answer. What we're looking for is um, people who are passionate about their subject so that on these very highly competitive courses, you can start to sift between all the people with fantastic grades and see the people that will thrive in the way that Nicola described earlier. So, a little more on the personal statement. So, it should be personal to you. And this sounds a little silly, but um, UCAS will talk about a number of examples of plagiarism. So there was a famous case of two twins who had been on a holiday, I think, to Costa Rica, were applying for biosciences, another one was applying for geography, and they both referred to this trip they'd done with their parents to Costa Rica. And UCAS basically flagged them, because there were too many similarities. They flagged them, they looked at them, they realised they were twins, the same address, the same surname, and then they put them back in. But I know there is a temptation, this is my own personal tip, at school, friends will say, can I see your personal statement? you have to find a nice way to say no because you don't want your personal statement pulled out and flagged. It is about you. It's about your personal passion. It's what you really want to tell the university. Um, and I think, yeah, it's... Yeah, well, I'll talk a little more about the structure. So we are looking here. We're not looking for broad breadth and everything that you've done outside of your subject area we're looking to see that you're really passionate about that subject. So about 75% should relate to the course that you want to study here, and about 25% to other things. So we don't want a shopping list on all the clubs and societies that you run at school, unless you're looking at a course where team working is relevant. What we want to know is why you're passionate about that, how you've taken your interest further, how you've reflected on that learning, whatever you've done, have you reflected and thought about it and why that makes you a better candidate to do that course. I can't emphasise enough fewer examples in detail and depth showing that you've reflected on the experience and thought about it is what universities are looking for. They don't want a massive shopping list, they want to know that you've really thought about it and that it ties together. 
And so to come back to the old admissions tutor I used to work with, he's right. If you can't write a great personal statement, then you possibly haven't worked out what you really want to study. And so now, most of you, I guess, will be the end of year 12, is a great time to really start trying to do that first draft because it'll help you work out if I definitely want to study English or maybe I want to think about complet, if I have always thought I want to study biology, but actually I quite like the idea of that arts and sciences degree that Nicola was talking about. Still think about it, question yourself, see if you can find enough examples to write a compelling personal statement. So, in summary, um, proofread the entire application. It sounds very obvious, but again, there are legendary examples of people not proofreading these things. And for something like medicine or law, it will be an immediate flag. If they find a, a grammatical or typing uh, spelling error in there, they will immediately take it out. And a bit of me thinks, I actually want a doctor who can proofread properly and pays attention to detail. So they are looking for those things straight off. It is completely acceptable for you to say that you want to change the world, if that's how you feel. You are 17 and 18. Admissions tutors expect you to believe that you can change the world. So the other piece of advice, and I say this as a parent, is take advice from your parents, but don't let them write it. Because once they start tinkering, which they will want to do, um, the admissions tutors say they can always hear the voice of a 50-year-old coming through a personal statement. So it is your personal statement and it should be true to you. And if you are going to change the world or you're going to create the next innovation, then I would say UCL is the place for you and write it in the personal statement, okay? Um, so proof it through. If you've got any queries, obviously today, talk to people, talk to the student ambassadors in yellow, talk to the academics and departments, don't leave with questions unanswered. Um, and make sure, of course, you apply on time. And that's it. We've got, I, have we got a couple of minutes for questions if there are any burning questions, but I will say to direct you back to the main campus, to the South Cloisters and the um, areas in the main quad where you can have discussions in detail with the academic departments um, and also find out more about student services. So actually, it looks like you're all ready to go, so I'm going to say, Come and ask me if there's anything specific, so have a great day.